Hi everyone, it's on to the next Poirot mystery with Taken at the Flood, which if we're just counting the full-length novels follows The Hollow, the last Poirot mystery I covered here. As always with my mystery reviews, there won't be any spoilers until the second half, at which point I'll give you a conspicuous warning just in case you're still reading this one. Taken at the Flood falls within your country village mystery paradigm, although to say just that would be missing a big part of its overall tone. Because on top of that, Taken of the Flood, more than Christie's other Poirot novels, especially conveys its setting within a post-World War II British society, or I guess what we'd now think of as within post-World War II British history. The book incorporates several historical themes of the time, focusing in particular on one woman's experience when she returns home from serving in the Wrens during World War II. And for those of you who don't know, since I didn't know when I was reading the novel, the Wrens, or WRNS, stands for the Women's Royal Naval Service, and it was the women's branch of the British Navy in both World War I and World War II. So these weren't exactly soldiers most of the time, but some of them did engage in very high-risk activities, including flying planes, high-risk enough that a number of them were killed or wounded in action. And others might have been doing behind-the-scenes work, like communications work, military logistics analysis, etc. We'll leave it at that because I don't know the full details, but that's where our sort of secondary protagonist behind Poirot, Lynn Marchmont, is coming from in this novel. And of course you can imagine how this young woman, whose place was still traditionally mostly seen as in the home at the time of the novel, with some exceptions I guess, would find herself in a bit of a weird place mentally, returning back home to a traditional, even perhaps somewhat boring, country village after participating in the war effort that made her important, utilized her abilities, and just allowed her to interact with the broader world. And although I'm focusing a lot on Lynn here because she's unquestionably the most interesting character here, the post-war environment, this return to normalcy period, it really affects all characters' psychology and relationships in an interesting way. Except only to a certain point because the characters in this book, including even the would-be main character Lynn, are not as interesting or relatable as some of those we saw in The Hollow, the previous book. Uh, at least not for me anyway. Sticking with Lynn for just a moment longer, she receives a lot of attention in the first third of the book or so, rightfully so, I think, but then she becomes quite distant for the rest of the story as she recedes into the broader pool of suspects. So much that by the end we'll be questioning whether she was even interesting in the first place. And this novel would have been flat out better if it continued to focus more closely on her as a main character. Like, we wouldn't have to hear every one of her inner thoughts, but Christy could have at least gone all in on the one character who really stands out, and basically everyone who talks about this novel agrees that she was the best character, hands down. Now the mystery itself, well, there are some interesting points, and it will keep you thinking, although it wasn't anywhere near my favorite of Christie's mystery plots, as a lot of it boils to just figuring out who we should believe, and the answer in these novels is of course no one, always. And here in particular, there's not much outside indication to prove anyone in particular is lying, so a lot of guesswork is involved. There is an interesting central point of who exactly the murdered man, a visitor to the town, actually is since we've received multiple firm testimonies arguing that he is a certain person and that he is definitely not that person. I'll come back to that point a bit more when I get to the spoilers, of course. Before that, though, sorry about not having so much pre-spoiler information today, but for the pre-spoiler assessment, the novel was not great. I found it among the worst of the Poirot novels I've read so far. It had some potential in its exploration of a post-war family, and in particular of a girl readjusting to the relative dullness of country life after wartime service ended, but the mystery was rather convoluted and, for me at least, not nearly as compelling as many of the others we've seen. Because with a final solution where the best that can be said is that it almost works, I guess. But only because it's about as far-fetched as all the other possibilities we were considering that were still remaining. Maybe even that is even a bit generous, but we'll get to that in a minute. Okay, so spoilers beginning. In this novel, Christie really takes the idea of not everyone is who you think they are to the extreme, as we find ourselves trying to guess whether each character has ever met another character, or has met them but doesn't recognize them for some reason, or recognizes them but is lying, etc. And of course, if someone doesn't recognize the character even though they should, then it could be that the former or the latter is an imposter, leading us to wonder for both Enoch Arden, the murdered man, and Rosaline Underhay, the supposed wife of the supposed true identity of the murdered man, supposedly murdered man, <laughs> who they really are, and then by extension trying to reason about what each of the other characters would know about them in that case. From a strict mystery perspective, it's probably one of the most unique aspects of the novel since it's a level beyond what we normally get. But it also kind of fizzles out by about halfway through the story since by then we've collected about as much information as we're going to get here. 
I guess the most interesting part is that it turns out to be not one of the two who's an imposter, but both. Enoch Arden is not even Robert Underhay, so I guess he's a double imposter. And Rosaline is not even Robert Underhay's wife. Therefore, it's no surprise whatsoever that the imposter cannot recognize the imposter. Okay, that part, in hindsight, is pretty clever, I admit. But I do not think the accidental murder aspect worked very well. It's plausible, I suppose, but if you worked all this out, you are either an amazing, amazing sleuth, or I was really missing some exceptionally clever clues earlier on, or both. In fact, the sheer lack of scruples in this book by just about every character will almost bring you to the point where everyone is basically a loose cannon who can't be expected to be even somewhat reliable. Like, I get that everyone has something to hide in a murder mystery, but in this novel, it's hard to even find anyone who's not deviously involved in their own little world of a complicated side plot. By the end, you might not even care to adjudicate like Poirot who the true murderer is. You'll just want everyone locked up. And then the insinuation by Poirot that the only death that really counted as criminal was the one at the very end of the book is... I don't know. What can I say? There are a lot of people behaving badly in this book. And it doesn't work well for the reader either. We're basically told that the killing we were investigating at the first seven-eighths of the book was important to solve, but that it doesn't count as a crime because it was an accident. Sort of like it would have been an accident if the murderer had actually just killed Lynn at the end of the book. Yes, at the end of the book, we have an attempted murder by a character who was, was the original murderer, but supposedly was not because it was an accident. And all for the sake of some final dramatic tension and deception, and in a way that destroys any sympathy for his already not at all likable character. It feels like a cheap attempt at drama for the final reveal, resorting to danger and deception rather than actually appealing to readers' preformed misinterpretations of the facts as Christie does in her better novels. Back to the topic of what's a crime and what's not a crime. One might argue that it's on the reader to morally judge the different characters to whatever extent you find fitting. The problem I see here, though, is that in Hercule Poirot books, Poirot's word is by and large the end-all be-all, both in terms of the murder solution and the morality of the people involved. If Poirot absolves the murderer of their sins, it's almost always a situation where the reader will agree, you're right, that person was in very extenuating circumstances and we can let them off the hook. The problem is that in this novel, perhaps for the first time, we set up a situation where we don't get that sense of closure, because unlike situations where we're on the fence about a character's guilt, but we can just defer to what Poirot decides. In this case, many readers will drastically disagree with Poirot about the guilt assigned to a character like Roly Claude. I mean, forgive me for being graphic here, but we're looking at a character who punched someone else hard enough that the victim stumbled and smashed his head on a fireplace and died, and then the accidental murderer gives the body a few more smashes with some fire tongs, not only to avert suspicion from himself, but to frame a specific other character. Then he recruits an outside person to lie about who the dead person is, and that outside party feels so bad about what he did that he kills himself. Now, can someone regret and atone for that sort of a mistake? Yes, absolutely, and in a better Christie novel, such a thing might happen in a believable way. But here, no one's going to be convinced by the notion that Roly has atoned or intends to manage his anger by less violent means after he then almost strangles his alleged sweetheart by the end of the book. It's for many of us the first time that we're clearly pitted against Paro on an actual matter of morals and justice. Maybe I'm overstating this a bit, but it seems to me like a big component of why this ending is so profoundly unsatisfying. Let me know in the comments if you have different opinions on this. Maybe this isn't even actually the first time you've drastically disagreed with Paro. But then, to add insult to injury, our would-be hero, Lynn, is also revealed to basically be a terrible judge of character, first falling for the actual murderer, actual murderer according to Poirot, and then once this is revealed, going for the would-be murderer instead, seduced by his violent passion in trying to kill her if he can't marry her. I could be wrong, but I just have a hard time imagining that even readers back in the late 1940s with different attitudes would have found anything attractive or desirable in the character of the self-pitying, apparently abusive Roly Claude. And as for readers in modern times, well, let's just say I personally didn't like it one bit, but I'm judging the book as a whole. It's pretty bad through and through, not only in this final turn of events, but for many recent readers, as will be apparent if you scroll through the reviews on Goodreads, the final scene outright ruined the novel for people even who were enjoying it up until then. 
which I think is actually quite fair if you initially considered Lynn Marchmont to be one of the shining aspects of this overall weak mystery novel. Now, I do understand that the most generous reading we might give to the ending is that it's not a happily ever after at all, but rather a cautionary note. The adventurous but naive Lynn Marchmont, in her fear of a dull life, has walked right into the arms of not one, but now two unscrupulous men, enticed by the desire for a life that will at least be interesting. Lynn Marchmont doesn't have to be a pure and innocent hero of this novel with a blissful, happily ever after ending. It could actually be that she's meant to be read as a more complex character who's likable, but has a fatal flaw that will spell her doom. Still, while I believe Christy capable of such an insinuation, a sort of tongue-in-cheek, happy but not really so happy ending. Her track record of romantic resolutions for the novel's heroes would suggest that we're supposed to just take it at face value as a happy ending, which we simply cannot do here. In conclusion, I would place this among the bottom fourth of Paro novels, ranking alongside Hercule Poirot's Christmas and One Two Buckle My Shoe. That's of course just my opinion though. What did you think? Are there any important clues or plot details that I missed, as I often do? Uh, maybe even more importantly, Am I missing something about what Christy was trying to say with the characters in this book? Let me know what you thought, uh, and until next time, bye, and happy reading.